In today's video, I'm going to answer a question from a viewer who wants to know a bit more about what an ocarina is and how it works. The ocarina is probably best known for being featured in the video game The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and I've heard that many people assumed it was a fictional instrument created for the game, and were surprised to learn it was actually real. In fact, the history of the ocarina goes back quite a long way. The earliest instruments that are recognisably related to the modern ocarina go back well over 10,000 years, and instruments that use essentially the same principles were found in many different civilizations, perhaps most notably in Central and South America. The technical term for this sort of instrument is a vessel flute. Most of them, including the modern ocarina, use a fipple, the same sort of mouthpiece as on a recorder or tin whistle. The difference is that where the recorder has an open-ended pipe, vessel flutes have an enclosed chamber, and the air inside this chamber resonates to produce the sound. In both cases, the pitch is varied by opening or closing the various finger holes, but they work in a slightly different way. On the recorder and most other woodwind instruments, the finger holes change the effective length of the pipe, and so the positioning of the holes is critical to get the correct pitches. However, on the ocarina, the pitch is determined by the total size of the open holes, so they can be placed almost anywhere on the instrument and will work just the same. The main limitation of a vessel flute is that you can't overblow it to produce a higher overtone, and so the maximum range of the instrument is about one and a half octaves. You can get double and even triple ocarinas that have extra chambers to extend the range. Another characteristic is that the volume varies with the amount of open holes, so higher notes will always sound louder than lower ones. You can compensate for this a little with breath pressure, but as that also affects the pitch, the ability to play dynamics on the ocarina is somewhat limited. This effect is much more noticeable on recordings than when playing live, so personally I tend to even out the volume of the different notes in post-production, especially for multi-track recordings where I want everything to blend nicely. Broadly speaking, modern ocarinas come in two main styles. The transverse, or Italian ocarina, was first created in 1853 by Giuseppe Donati, a brickmaker from Budrio in northern Italy. It uses a fingering system that will be familiar to most woodwind players, where you get the next note at the scale by opening the next hole in sequence. Donati made his instruments from clay, and fired them in the same kilns that he used for his bricks. Ceramics are still the most traditional choice of material for making ocarinas, but you can also find them in metal, wood and plastic. The pendant, or English ocarina, was developed in the 1960s by the English mathematician John Taylor. This uses a completely different approach to fingering, and can produce an entire octave with just four holes. Because the holes are all different sizes, opening different combinations of them produces different notes. The system was later developed with one or two thumb holes to add an extra note or two to the top of the range. The name pendant comes from the fact that these ocarinas are traditionally made with a string for securing the instrument around the player's neck, and so some of the smaller ones can be worn as a sort of jewellery. As well as these two main types, there are other sorts of ocarinas that are less standardised. For example, this linear ocarina uses the fingering system of the transverse instrument, but rotated 90 degrees, and this tiny soprano pendant has the finger holes oriented more like a transverse ocarina. The makers call it a gosling because the word ocarina comes from the Italian for small goose. To demonstrate the different types of ocarinas, I'm going to play a folk song that I've arranged to use as many of them as possible. The song I've chosen is Geordie, a ballad that is traditionally sung across Great Britain and in parts of North America. It tells the story of a young man's trial in which his lover pleads for his life. Apparently in most Scottish versions of the ballad, her pleading is successful and results in Geordie's release but my version is based on one collected by Cecil Sharp in Somerset, where they're not so lucky. <laughs> 